Well, here we are. It is uh, Thursday, May 18th, 2023. And in this video, I'm going to talk a bit about the sales that are coming up in Hong Kong in a couple of weeks around the 30th, 30th, 31st and 1st of June uh, at Christie's. And they have uh, several great sales lined up, some very rare objects as always, and uh, some, some nice bits from very good old collections, which are, of course, very crucial these days in uh, uh, marketing. Uh, old collections draw enormous amounts of interest. Um, from hardcore collectors, uh, especially things that have been off the market for a substantial period of time or are extremely and or are extremely rare. And uh, the catalogs have all been loaded. If you come over to Bitamount and you scroll down to the red boxes, most of you that are watching are familiar with them. You click that. It brings you over here to the bookshelf. And uh, there are 755 books and catalogs in here now. They're all free to use, of course. And the top row always has the most recent. And uh, recently, uh, the sales that we've added, of course, is the Agut sale that we mentioned a few weeks ago. We're going to talk about that a bit more tomorrow in the weekly video because uh, they have some nice things in there. And then you have the, the, the catalogs before it, which are the Christie sales. All right, and they are spectacular. Uh, this is the uh, important Chinese works of art catalog, which is very good. We're going to go through that. Selected collection, uh, treasures from the Palmer family collection, which is a very nice old British collection that's going to elicit a lot of interest. And then there's the Robert uh, uh, Sissy and Robert Tang collection of classical Chinese furniture. And as we know, classical Chinese furniture has been riding a real wave the last over the last six or seven years in particular. They've really done very, very well. And then there's this, the Imperial Palette, Three Chinlung Treasures. And uh, this is a, a, a sort of a, a specialized catalog with just three objects in it. All of them are fabulous. And uh, we're going to talk about those. But what I thought would be fun to do this time, that, uh, uh, that something I haven't done before, is is I'm going to talk about the things, if, if I could go to Christie's, and uh, somebody said to me, you buy whatever you want. You can buy a few things from each sale and just buy the thing that you like the most. Not the thing I'm going to try to sell and make a living off of um, or, or anything like that, but what aesthetically most would appeal to me as a collector. And I think that as a, I'm a dealer and I'm a collector and I collect, I've shared the things I've collected over the years. And as, a, as to, to be a good dealer, I think you have to be an interested collector as well. I don't think you can you can you you can exclude um, uh, uh, your interest in collecting. If you don't collect and you're a dealer, um, I think that in general you're you're you may make a living at it, but I don't think you'll ever be a great and very happy dealer. Um, uh, because you need to collect, you need to have a personal interest, and, and that's the I think that's the thing that keeps you interested. That's one of the things that, that drives you when you go to previews, when you go out to look around at antique shops and things. You, as a dealer, I wear two hats. I buy, I look for things that I can buy and sell that are of good quality that I think I have customers for, and then there are things that I'm also looking for that I will add to my own collection if they make sense and, and appeal to me in, in, in a strong way. And in this case, I'm going to go through this and treat it as though. I'm not going to sell it. I'm buying things that I just personally like, and it's got nothing to do with the with the money. Though some of the things are probably going to be pretty expensive, but some of the things aren't um, relative to some of the prices we've seen. All right, and we're going to start with this uh, the, the the three treasures. We're going to start here, and there are three of them. There's a hat stand, a Chinlung revolving vase, and in, in the in the Dao Sai with red dragon um, uh, uh, moon flask. All right. And all of them are terrific. All of them are terrific. And there's no right or wrong thing to collect, I don't think. I think it's just a very personal thing. And the first thing we'll see here is this. This is a hat stand, an imperial hat stand, Mark, Mark and Period Chinlung. And it's made of porcelain, but it's done uh, to emulate bronze. Uh, with gold uh, uh, gold trim and so forth. It's very finely made, wonderfully reticulated. Uh, just a great example and it has these very uh, beautiful uh, uh, turquoise porcelain uh, they look like turquoise uh, stone but they're actually porcelain and this was something that many of you are aware of that during the Chinlung period especially they did things to uh, sort of trompe l'oeil uh, or faux bois decoration they called it sometimes things that would look like look like some other material in this case they look like this thing looks like it's made of bronze with turquoise stone insets and it's really porce, all porcelain 
with and then just decorated to look that way and uh, this is a very nice example it's a rare example and uh, beautifully made and it's got a significant estimate there's no doubt about it. it's estimated at five million to eight million Hong Kong dollars and that works out roughly to around six hundred and fifty to uh, a mil six hundred fifty thousand to a million dollars for this piece and then there's this, this very, very rare and lovely reticulated revolving Chinlung Markin period vase in Famille Rose with this very fine um, green uh, ground in the lattice. And then again, you see this lovely iron red uh, open area with the Buddhist swastika. And then you can look inside and see the revolving uh, Famille Rose cylinder. This is a wonderful example, uh, meticulously decorated. The enameling on this is so fine. And on this, again, you see the same color. Um, these handles are, are virtually the same school or the same type of work that you see on that you saw on this. Um, they're done to emulate uh, uh, bronze. And on this vase, they put these handles on there that, so they look like bronze mounts, and, but they're done in porcelain, of course, and then uh, highlined in gilt, these beautiful little chimera dragons. And then looking down at you have very fine enameling, uh, superb enameling. The enameling on this face is really extraordinary. And uh, all the way to the bottom, and it's in, it looks to be in absolutely superb condition. And then again, has this meticulously interior painted. It looks like a dragon boat festival in the, in the inside. And you can revolve it and, and look through the window and watch, watch the boat go by. Uh, estimated at 20 to 30 million Hong Kong dollars. Um, and uh, so if you do the math on that, the, the exchange rate is about eight to one, roughly. That's sort of a ballpark figure. So this is estimated somewhere between uh, 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 two and a half and 3.9, 3.8 million US dollars. And then lastly, is this the most expensive thing or the highest, most highly estimated thing? Is this the uh, the the big the big dragon uh, f front uh, moon flask and Daozi enamels, and uh, the Daozi enameling on this vase is spectacularly well done, beautiful colors, beautiful selection of colors, and uh, again you see uh, the, these uh, chimera handles at the top. And then this uh, very chinlungy dragon um, with this uh, sort of uh, look of surprise on his face. Um, uh, they're very, they're uh, chinlung dragons and, and Qing dragons are drawn very differently than Ming dragons. Um, the Ming dragons always have sort of a look almost like a cartoonish, I, I think uh, I call them cartoonish looking. And this one is much more, uh, more refined, uh, pretty stately looking thing. And uh, then you have the smaller dragon below in, in teal and so forth and then you have the crashing waves at the bottom very very rare vase uh and uh, is estimated at uh, 10 to 12 million dollars roughly 10 to 15, 10 to 13 million us dollars uh it is 20 inches high it's got a long bunch of provenance of previous owners it's had several owners since 1991 alone um, i'm not sure where they don't say it was originally came into the market through phillips in London back in 1991 and it's been sold several times since and uh, it's been off the market since 1998 and during that the first uh, uh, eight or so years after it, was, it came to market it was owned by several different people and uh, heck of a good looking thing so which, which of the three would you would, would you would you would you go after and you have to ask yourself which one is it and uh, in my case I prefer the hat stand uh, it's not the most expensive thing, that's for sure. But I think it's, for me, aesthetically, uh, from a viewing standpoint, it's, the I think, the, the more interesting um, f because that's my personal taste. And uh, it's got nothing to do with value. It's got nothing to do with anything else other than it personally appeals to me the most. Uh, I like the idea that the ro I have sort of a romantic idea that, you know, you can picture Chin Lung taking his hat off at the end of a long day, putting it on the hat stand uh, to dry out. And, uh, it may, you know, maybe he kept this in his bedroom. Um, maybe he kept it in his office. Who knows? But it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing, and, and it served a, a real function. Vases serve a real function, too. You know, they put flowers in them and all that. But this is a, a, a very interesting example to me. And uh, it's the one I, I personally would pick. It's the one I personally would pick. And then we get over here to important Chinese ceramics and works of art. There's lots of things to pick from. There's, there's some very nice um, uh, Jin and Yuan and Sung pieces at the beginning. There's some nice double gourd example. There's some beautiful celadons. There's some nice Sung bowls, uh, Kangxi and Ming pieces and so on all the way down. 
And um, what would, let's see, we'll start with vases. Okay, there are th three vases in particular that uh, have, have significant estimates. Um, and I'm just gonna go through my, my thinking on which one I would pick, if I could pick one. And uh, you have this one, it's a very unusual looking uh, Chin Lung Mark and Period vase. It's, uh, what is it, 20, 26 inches tall. It's a pretty big vase, it's over two feet tall, it's a beast. And uh, it has this uh, wonderful uh, cobalt uh, uh, frame in the center part of the body with an open cartouche in the middle that's left undecorated. And then you go up the body to uh, here and you have the, the Chinese chime hanging down with uh, pendants or creatures hanging off of it and, and so forth. Beautiful looking thing. Two to three million Hong Kong dollars. That works out to, uh, let's see here, eight... Uh, uh, how much money is that roughly? Um, roughly three, uh, three, 275,000 and up to maybe, you know, $400,000 somewhere in there. All right. And then there's this very rare bird. Uh, this is a Xuan de Marken period underglazed blue um, uh, uh, pomegranate type vase. Uh, there's only, I, th I think according to the description, there were only three of these or four of these known in the world. Um, a couple of them, are, one of them is in the Palace Museum. There's another museum in China that has one. There's one in the Pilkington Collection. But that's Mark and Period. There are other examples that are known that are, that are around that are not Mark and Period, but very, very similar in decoration. But this is a Mark and Period one, which makes it extremely rare. One of three or four in the world. All right. It's nicely decorated. Uh, has a, a, a beautiful heaped in piling effect, as they call it, in the uh, cobalt. Here you can here you can really see it in here these 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 dark spots where the cobalt sort of burned through the glaze a bit during the firing and so forth. Very very rare thing. Estimated at twenty five to thirty five million dollars, uh, Hong Kong dollars. So that would uh, boil out to around um, uh, 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 four to uh, what is that four to uh, five million U.S. somewhere around there, right? Four to five million U.S. Um, a little at the four to seven million, I guess it would be. And then you have this pear shaped um, red ground with gilt and silver decoration on it. Uh, this is an interesting vase. We've seen this pattern in a palette before uh, when, when, when the bodies are decorated with gold and silver. It's a nice mixture. Um, a couple of years ago, there was that wonderful one that we talked about that was in a sale over in Europe, uh, a Pandolfini or somebody had it, and it was auspicious blue Chan Chu Ping with um, a decoration of uh, silver and gold. And this one is meticulously decorated, a beautiful ground color behind it, very rich, like a deep, 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 almost, almost like a dark ruby or, or light maroon. Uh, very nice example. And this is estimated a bit more modestly at just three to 500,000 Hong Kong dollars, which is, again, a significant uh, uh, amount of money. And uh, then we get over here to the moon flask, fine flambe uh, glaze moon flask, Yongchen Markin period. Um, again, a very, very attractive vase. Uh, beautiful flambe decoration. There it is. Um, it's just outstanding all the way down. And the color is, uh, you know, pretty luscious, as they say. And this is estimated at 3.5 to 5.5 um, um, a million Hong Kong. So that would be four in the in the four hundred to uh, 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 five hundred thousand dollar range, roughly um, uh, uh, four to six six hundred thousand somewhere in there. All right, and uh, this is an interesting one. It comes from the Mayan Tang collection. Uh, Regina Kral has written about it when she wrote the Mayan Tang uh, uh, catalog. It's been exhibited and all that good stuff. There's a good lot essay on it. All three of these are, are, are very interesting and desirable. Um, or all four of these, rather. So which one would I pick out of all four? If I could have my choice, had my druthers, which one would I want? Um, I would want the Flambe Moon Flask. Uh, just because I love monochromes, the colors jump out at me. Now, you may love something else. You may, maybe you like the Shundi, uh, uh, a pomegranate vase, something like that. Certainly worth more. Uh, but I, I like this. I, this appeals to me greatly. And uh, I think it's the only one in the world, actually, from what I recall about reading it, done in this in this exact style. But I just think the colors are just so glorious. The, 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 the blue flambe over the red, the red ground is beautiful. And then they did the neck in blue with, with, a, with a lighter sort of red background. Uh, it's a real 
I don't know. To me, it's just aesthetically uh, hits me uh, like a ton of bricks. I like this a great deal. All right. And you, and you may prefer that and you, or you may prefer that. Like I said, there's no wrong or right answer here. This is just my personal choice. I think this is a heck of a beautiful thing. Um, I think it'll do pretty well. I suspect it will. Uh, there's, a, there's a nice lot essay down here at the bottom explaining um, um, what was going on during the Yongshan period when they developed this. And uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting, very interesting thing from an academic standpoint. All right. And there was something else I picked up on that I looked at, and um, this was in the same sale. And I, I was thinking, boy, that, that'd be really great. And there's one thing about this, as elegant as these cloisonne panels are, they're on a beautiful Z10 stands. There's one thing that really bugged me about it, and I wouldn't want them. And what it is, is they're identical. Um, uh, they both have virtually, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a masterpiece in the sense that, how, you know, the, the, the artist was able to duplicate it so precisely, so, so meticulously. But I, I don't typically like identical pairs uh, too much unless they're monochromes. Um, and in, in this one, they have the exact same scene on both pieces. And uh, I would be absolutely in love with these if they had different scenes or were opposing one another mir mirrored pairs with slight variations in other words what, what they what they refer to as complementary pairs then I, I would I would like it a lot more but for the fact that they're identical and they seem sort of like just a copy one copying the other it, it, it for my personal taste it doesn't appeal to me as much I love them and um, if I could own, maybe just buy one of them that would be a great thing but but owning a pair of this type doesn't appeal to me and, they, and they're very very good and they're estimated at 250 to 450 thousand Hong Kong dollars so they're, they're obviously of great value and I'm sure they'll do well they, they're a pretty good size these are 25 inches tall they look small in the pictures but they're actually over two feet tall so um, they're it is of significant size and I, I just wish that they, and they're also Chin Lung period they're not signed but I would I, I do wish that um, they had the artist had used a different scene on each one um, in the same style but just slightly different and then I, th I think they would have been absolutely terrific and uh, you, you may like pairs and, and that's fine too that's my personal choice and then in the sale there is uh, there were some very interesting ink stones and when it came to the ink stones there were two that I liked a lot and this is this is one of them I think these are this is an absolutely beautiful example and it's a bell form uh, which is very unusual and they picked a wonderful colored stone it has its original box with green lettering on the top but the wood grain is spectacular and the carving of the stone is very 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 refined and it reminds me a bit of the hat stand it's sort of a this carving up here is very reminiscent that was the style in the period um, these are uh, uh, Chin Lung, I believe, examples I'll go back and check in a second and I love how they put the the artist put the deer on the back down here at the bottom a little spotted deer I thought that was just terrific and uh, up here at the top they have this finely worked sort of archaistic reticulated upper section um, Qing Dynasty they date these as 19th century they look 18th century to me but the, the, the people at Christie's think they're 19th century but beautiful beautiful colored stone uh, estimated at 150 to 200,000 Hong Kong dollars so that works out to roughly uh, 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 you know around uh, that comes out to about uh, 18 or 20,000 and up to maybe as uh, you know as much as uh, 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 25,000 for the for the for the set but I thought they were just absolutely great I really did and I, I like them just as much as I like this this is a, a very unusual thing it's a Z-Tan box with a tiger a very rare tiger form ink stone and cover um, it's inscribed uh, 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 Chegney tiger form uh, they refer to it it's got a Z-Tan box um, the original box all in beautifully done in Z-Tan wood inscribed on the interior and that's the ink stone that's that's the stone and uh, what I really like about this is the fact that it looks like it looks like a bronze. It's got the green the green uh, pits all over it, and it's I think what the artist was trying to do was to make the stone uh, come out looking like bronze, uh, with green spots on it and verdigris and uh, red spots and the, the kind of surface that you see on old bronzes. And he has this terrific expression on his face. This is a very very rare um, uh, ink stone. Uh, if you're into scholars objects, this is an amazing thing. There's the interior of it and there's the well uh, to the stone. Pull it in and uh, here you have it. 
there's a, there's a yang and yin um, uh, pool, uh, you know, for the, for, the, for, the, for the water to go into the liquid. Uh, estimated at four to six hundred thousand, four to six million Hong Kong, excuse me. Uh, so that comes out to about, you know, half a million to uh, six million, six, six and a half million um, US dollars. It's very, very, very rare. Uh, and I like them both almost equally. Um, aesthetically, I like this one beca because of I its own personal characteristics. I love the fact that it's got a box. I love Z-Tan wood. And, it's, and Z-Tan, of course, is very hard to get but it's, it's it, because it's basically extinct at this point. But uh, this is a, 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 a beautifully, the carving of the box with the birds and the flowers and uh, the script and all that, and then beautifully done script on the interior of it, and then you have the stone. Um, and this has a very good provenance. It has comes from a very. If you go down here at the bottom, you can you can read up on it. And it belonged originally to uh, Ono uh, Shozan, who died in 1952. Um, the box. Uh, let's see here. Uh, it, it dated to uh, as an inscription um, from him, inscription by um, uh, him, dated to 1927. And Shozan was a very famous um, uh, uh, sinologist and calligrapher who lived in Japan. He was a major major collection of scholars' tables, objects, and so forth, which makes it. I think it makes him a bit more interesting. Uh, he wasn't just a, a rich collector. He was a collector who specialized in calligraphy, script, table objects, and that sort of thing. Uh, I thought it was just terrific. And then over here, this is the uh, Palmer collection. And the Palmer family have been collecting for a long time. They're a British family. They, they owned a uh, famous biscuit company in England for a long time. And it grew and grew and grew. It ended up with uh, eight or 10,000 employees. Uh, the family was financially, of course, very successful. And they took up collecting. And this is a sort of a multi-generational collection with some very interesting things. They focused uh, primarily, as you can see, on objects of the Qing dynasty, and in particular, Kung Shi period. Um, the Kangxi and Yongchen period. This was the area they were most interested in. Uh, they didn't collect early wares. They collected uh, mostly wares of the 18th century. And uh, they had a number of things that I would just love to own. Um, and this is, this is the kind of thing that you see from old collections, things that are aesthetically amazing. Uh, one of them is this. And this is something that was interesting that uh, Stuart and uh, uh, Samuel Marchant mentioned. Uh, we were talking, um, and I think it's on the video from the interview last week, but they were talking about the, the, the strange um, uh, thing that uh, uh, Chinese buyers, um, Chinese collectors, for some reason, aren't that interested in these biscuit wares. And this was, and biscuit wares were very popularly collected at the early 20th century by foreigners, by Westerners, um, when they brought them out. And I, I don't think there were many of them, there was much of it left in China, so the Chinese maybe weren't that familiar with it. But uh, there's some significant biscuit ware collections floating around. And this is a perfumer. This is a pretty rare one. Uh, and it's beautifully done. It's got the, the very typical uh, 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 basket ha type handle that you see on Kung Shi teapots and so forth in biscuit. And it's got this nicely done reticulated body. It's fairly small. This thing's only four or five inches, right? Uh, five and one eighth inches high. Very small, very delicate, very unusual. And uh, it's, it's it also, if you're if, from a financial standpoint, if you're interested in collecting early Chinese wares, right now these things are a bargain uh, because the the, the, the uh, Chinese collector market hasn't glommed on to biscuit wares yet. Eventually they will. Eventually they'll wake up and go, why aren't we? What's wrong with these? These are made for our market. Um, and that's something that uh, 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 Stuart Marchant pointed out. He said th these things weren't made for export. These were Chinese domestic market wares. And for some reason, the, the Chinese collectors have sort of hopped over it. And maybe it's because they're not American, period. I don't know, but I think they're wonderful. This one is estimated at 150 to 200,000 Hong Kong dollars, which is not an insignificant amount of money. Um, it, that, that comes out to about 16, 16 to 20, 24,000 dollars for this, but it's a very lovely example, beautifully done. It looks like it's in great condition. And uh, that, that is something I would love to own. I really like that. And then this, this is the thing that caught my eye right off the bat, looking at the uh, Palmer collection, is this uh, 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 Ming, um, uh, very unusually potted uh, teapot. Um, with the, with the phoenix on it and this uh, this sort of uh, 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 elliptical or pear shaped I don't know what you call this body um, a rounded body with a pointed lid on it and then this very nicely done elegant arched handle all decorated 
with a flange on top. And then you have this very nice sort of Middle Eastern looking handle coming out of it. This may be based on, this looks like it's based on a Middle Eastern metal form of some kind. But I, the, the, if those of you that buy, buy uh, late Ming, early Qing uh, teapots, um, when was the last time you saw one that looked like this? Uh, very unusual, aesthetically very successful. The proportions are all great. The cobalt is very good quality cobalt, nice and dark, good color, nice outlining, um, and meticulously done. I, I really like this. This is terrific. Um, the estimate is uh, roughly, uh, what does it work out to? About uh, thirteen to $15,000. But what a rare thing. What a really, really rare thing. And then over here to this, this is another ewer based on a Middle Eastern um, uh, metal form, is this Kangxi ewer. And again, um, I, I like ewers, I like teapots and ewers, but this one just struck me as being highly unusual. The color palette is amazing. The porcelain is in great, 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 very refined uh, color. Um, really, really like it a great deal. I love, I love how they have the, the dragon heads coming off the handle and coming um, back from the spout and then fighting over the pearl right here. Uh, it's got a little firing line up in here, which is normal because there's a bend there and it creates a little bit of a line. And it's got its original cover, which is very unusual. Most of the time, these are long gone. And you only, you typically only find r rare forms like this coming out of old collections. This is the kind of thing you find in great old British collections. Uh, and I, I absolutely love this thing. It's about uh, 11 inches tall, estimated, I think, pretty modestly at, at, at uh, 100 to 150,000 Hong Kong. Um, so that works out to, you know, 12 or 13 and up to uh, maybe, uh, you know, $16,000. Uh, I think, I think this, is, this is something I would just love to own. And, uh, and I'm not knocking the rest of the collection. This is, I'll scroll down through the collection here. Here it is. It is a beautiful collection. Lots of great Qing wares, lots of great Kung Shi wares, great brush pots, uh, all kinds of fantastic things. And they all appear to be in quite extraordinary condition. The condition of this collection seems excellent. I looked at a lot of the pictures. Um, uh, you don't see a lot of chipping on the enamels, um, uh, uh, meticulously uh, uh, kept um, for all the time they've been there. Even the, uh, these uh, enamel wares on copper um, uh, aren't bent or damaged in any way. There's a few bits of cloisonne. There's a very rare ruby back Young Chen dish in the sale. There's some nice Qing jades. I guess Mrs. Palmer was a bit of a fan of jades, um, uh, according to the write-up I saw. Uh, she, she liked Qing jade in particular. She was a big nephrite fan, and uh, th that, that's that. So at any rate, so you had this, you had this, you had that, from, and then this from the Palmer collection. And of all the three Kung Shi, of all the Kung Shi pieces we looked at, this one is the one I would want the most. I, I would I'd be thrilled to death if I could have this one, this one, um, of course. But but this one is, and if you're looking at it, saying God, that's unusual looking. Um, it is. This is a very unusual color palette for Kung Shi wares. Uh, uh, beautifully potted, meticulously painted, brightly colored, milk white background. Nice potting, uh, even with this nice little finish at the bottom, the way they trimmed it. Um, and this is not a big vase. I think this vase is probably, eight, I haven't looked at the height, but I bet it's eight or nine inches or something. Um, eight, eight, seven and seven eighths inches, eight inches tall. Uh, it's, it's this form, uh, they didn't generally make them very big, but it's a, a very, very refined, very delicate, very elegant. This is such an elegant piece of porcelain, estimated at 400 to 600,000 Hong Kong dollars. Um, so that works out to roughly um, um, uh, 50 to uh, 60 or 70,000 dollars US. I think this is a fantastic piece of Kung Shi ware. I really, really do. It's, it's, it's one of the nicest ones I've seen in a while, I think. Um, but it, and it's not because it's overly decorated. It's rather lightly decorated, but very, very finely done and perfect color selection and perfect potting. Uh, so that's that. And then this, um, Kangxi, Kangxi mystical, mythical piece, plate dishes, uh, plates turn up from time to time. But this one struck me as being one of the nicest ones I've seen in a while. It's estimated at eighty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars Hong Kong dollars. So it's estimated for between ten and oh fifteen thousand. It's fourteen and a half inches wide, but when you pull it in and look at it, it's dazzling. 
Um, uh, the, the board of decorations are wonderful. There's a little bit of fritting on the rim, but nothing too distracting like you see on some Kung Shi wares. Uh, you've got these beautiful blue, overglazed blue enamels. I, and, and I like this color here. This, the, the, this big uh, uh, peony has a rather unusual bluish tone to it. It's got, almost got a little gray in it. And then you have the Kirin on the ground, um, uh, drawing the attention of the Phoenix coming in on it. But the condition of the enamels throughout this whole plate are just stupendous. Um, and it looks to be in great, great, great condition. Um, and again, the, the, those are the, the, I, I went a little wild on the Palmer collection, I guess. There were a number of things in there that I, I just was very uh, caught with. Um, but I, I think that if I had my choice out of all of all everything in that whole sale, everything in that collection, if I could, if if the building was on fire and I could only run out with one piece, this was the one I'd run out with, um, and, uh, and so forth. And then the last section is here. This is the uh, the Sissy and Robert Tang collection of classical Chinese furniture, and um, as we all know, cl cl uh, classical Ming furniture has had a real a um, lot of interest in, in the last eight or ten years, especially last few years, we've seen some amazing results. And this is a good collection. There's some awfully nice pieces in here. There's a superb pair of uh, Juan Wally chairs. Um, big estimates on them, but they're very, very rare. Um, uh, so they're, they're date, they date them to the, the 17th century. They're probably early, uh, late, late, late Ming. Uh, but very fantastically decorated, put it that way. Yoke back chairs. Um, they, they were last sold um, by Robert Ellsworth in 1989. Talk about great collector dealers. And they are estimated at 8 to 12 million Hong Kong or roughly 1 to um, 1 1.4 million US. All right. And these are a wonderful pair of chairs. And look at the carving across the aprons. This is what really, really caught my eye on these. The car I love carving on Ming furniture, old Ming carving. I like the, st the straight, simple lines, but I love it when they, when they get into it and do some nice carving. And this is a very unusual uh, 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 carving area here. And then the back splat, of course, is pierced and uh, is, is carved as well here and there with creatures. And notice the wood grain on the back splat. It's, it's perfectly matched to the chair, beautifully framed chair in great condition. And uh, the other thing that I, it, it, so my, my choice out of the furniture pile, I think would be this. They are the most expensive things on the sale, but it's not why I like them. I like them because they have amazing carving, amazing wood color and so forth. But as much, I like these two cabinets. And uh, I think he also got these from, yeah, he also got these from Els, Robert Ellsworth. And these are estimated uh, relatively much for much much less money estimated 800,000 to 1.2 million Hong Kong or you know 100 to 130 thousand dollars this beautiful pair of, of cabinets um, and they date these as being Qing early you know early uh, maybe Qinlong or uh, Kangxi period um, and these are these are sort of the later furniture that's in the sale <laughs> in, in their opinion they are 28 by 24 inches roughly but what caught my eye about them was the, the, the way the, the, the reticulated doors and panels were done. Um, and I hope you can see this. But down here, they have um, uh, the, 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 the dragons swirling around, around this sort of vase-formed object. But the upper section is a straight lattice. So you can look through, really look through the piece. And uh, it's, these, these were left open so, they, so that air could flow through them. Um, just an absolutely wonderful looking pair of cabinets. And uh, again, estimated at a fraction of the chairs. And if, if it's a coin toss on, uh, again, my personal taste is, it's, to me, it's a coin toss which one I would prefer over the other, even though the values are, are, are uh, th these are you know, roughly 10 times more, going to be more expensive. Uh, I, I, could, I could be equally as happy with this pair of cabinets as I could with the pair of chairs. Love to get them both, but um, it's again not about the money it's about your personal taste and what you really really like and that and if you're a collector that's what you should be doing uh, I really urge you not to develop a, I always tell collectors don't buy things because they're expensive if, if you're buying things because they're expensive then you're not really a collector you're a price buyer and you're looking for maybe for for status and getting patted on the back 
uh, from somebody. But if you're if you're really serious and you really want to buy things that aesthetically appeal to you, that will work in your in your home, because you do want to live with your with art. If you're a collector and you don't live with it, you're missing out. And there are people that collect that, that don't. They keep it. They keep everything. They, they buy it and they they have it for a time and they put it in storage. And uh, if you find yourself putting antiques that you own into storage, sell them. Let somebody else enjoy them and uh, uh, take the proceeds and, 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 and build back into your collection. Uh, but uh, I, I never recommend p people put things in storage unless it's temporary because you're moving or something. But other than that, don't do that. Sell them and move on. Um, and, and it keeps the art market going. All right. But this, this, these are the things that I would personally like. And I'd be curious to hear your comments. Comment on that down below. Say what you would like the best. Go through the catalogs. And uh, there is no right or wrong. Um, it's all a matter of personal preference. And, and But those are the things I personally um, would would like to own if I if I had the chance. And, um, um, you know, a long lost rich uncle left me a, a blank check and said, go to Christie's and buy whatever you want. Those are the things I would buy. All right. Have a wonderful time. We'll be back tomorrow with the regular weekly video. If you haven't subscribed yet on the channel, please do. Um, we got we're over 20. A number of you noticed. We're over, I, I, haven't, I don't pay as lot as much attention as I suppose I should to how many subscribers are. But there's 20,200 20, something subscribers. I did look this morning, uh, which is kind of shocking. All right. Have a great week. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow with the regular weekly video. And uh, thanks so much for watching. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Bye-bye.